Hey guys, Spud here, as always, and thank you for joining me once again in DCS World 2.8. Now in this video, we're still kind of going through all of the changes that came with this very comprehensive open beta update. Now, one of the additions to DCS that you may have missed as you were scrolling through that whole big wall of text in the change log is the addition of two additional weapons to the JF-17 Thunder's arsenal. Now, a lot of folks tend to sleep on the JF-17. They don't fly it because it's small, it can't carry all that much gas, so it runs out of gas quick and doesn't have much range, as well as it doesn't carry all that many weapons, and it doesn't carry a very good Fox 2 for self-defense. And I definitely, absolutely, 100% agree with that last point. However, this uh, new addition of these two weapons is really going to increase your air-to-ground magazine depth, for lack of a better term, and allow you to be a bit more effective in the air-to-ground role over the digital battlefield. It'll also allow the JF-17 Thunder to become even more of a monster in the SEAD role, because now you can have some additional weapons to bring to knock out SAM sites other than just the LD-10 that you had before. It'll also allow you to take a few more air-to-ground weapons with you to the battlefield and still carry some SD-10s for self-defense, because we, as we all know, those PL-5s are just useless when it comes to air-to-air -to -air combat. So let's go ahead and build our loadout here. We'll put some PL-5s on our wingtips because I guess we can scare the enemy with them. <laughs> and then uh, we'll put a WMD-7 targeting pod on our center line station there. We'll put a couple fuel tanks on our wings here. Now these gigantic fuel tanks that we can carry on the JF-17 pretty much double the fuel carrying capacity of the aircraft. And that paired with the air-to-air -air refueling probe, it really kind of nullifies the fuel uh, uh, quantity as well as your range issue that people tend to have with the JF-17. Now the two new weapons in question are in the bombs category and they are the LS-6-100 and the LS-6-250. These are essentially JDAMs and JSALs, very similar to their western equivalents. Now, the idea of the LS LS6 is it's a family of weapons that use essentially common parts to then be fitted to older existing dumb bombs. Very, very similar to the way American uh, Paveway series and JDAM series work in turning existing uh, general purpose bombs into smart weapons. Of course, China, as well as other nations, have ma massive stockpiles of those old-fashioned dumb bombs from the Cold War years, so having a kit that can go on to those to turn those dumb bombs into smart weapons is a fantastic idea. And while pioneered in the West, it seems to be a very good idea for the East to kind of take that idea and run with it, almost kind of an obvious kind of situation to copy. Now, something that's interesting to note about um, Eastern guided weaponry like the LS-6 or other Russian equivalents to it, as well as their laser guided bomb equivalents is <laughs> kind of funny, but a lot of Eastern dumb bombs, general purpose bombs, tend to be very fat and very kind of like World War II-ish looking. The East did not necessarily come up with a program to create those very uh, kind of skinny, very long and very, you know, streamlined general purpose bombs that the U.S. built in the Mark 80 series. And so thus you have JDAMs and other smart munitions that are employed by Russian and Chinese jets that are quite fat and quite draggy as a result. So kind of a funny fun fact there, but I've always found that very interesting and that uh, Western air to ground weaponry always looks very sleek, very streamlined and really going to not potentially add too much of a detriment to the drag of Western aircraft. Whereas you look at Chinese and Russian jets and you see that their smart weaponry is just as fat, just as huge and just as draggy as their dumb weapons are. So with that, we can see that we can carry essentially four JSOWs with our JF-17. Now, before you could only carry two JSOWs in the form of the LS-6500, which we can see down here, which is an even larger version of the same weapon class. 
But now that we have the 250 dual, we have two of them on each side of the aircraft, which means we don't have to sacrifice as many weapons to, say, carry some SD-10s for self-defense, because we know those PL-5s are just trash anyway. Now, if we do carry, say, four of these LS6250s, then we can definitely do some pretty awesome standoff work against some SAM sites, which we're going to demonstrate today. Now, you may be asking, Spud, let's take a look at those uh, LS6100s, and we absolutely will. And you can see these are quite small bombs. Now, the Russians and the Chinese tended to have some very, very teeny tiny general purpose bombs in their inventory for quite a long time. And this is because the Chinese and the Russians flew some pretty teeny tiny aircraft for quite a long time in their inventories. This included, you know, things like the MiG-15, 17, MiG-19, and of course their Chinese copied equivalents. So things like that that needed some much, much smaller bombs. So might as well throw a JDAM type kit onto these guys and turn them into smart weapons. And there you go, Bob's your uncle. You've already got a ready to go, basically small diameter bomb. Something to keep in mind here, though, guys, is that these LS6 100s do not have wings and they are not glide bombs. So you're going to have to get a lot closer to the target to engage with them. But cool thing is, they're the closest thing we now have in DCS world to small diameter bombs. But for today's mission, we're going to be doing a little bit of CAD work. So we're going to go for those LS6 250s with the glide wings. So that way we can get a little bit more standoff range here. So with that said, why don't we hop in the cockpit and run a little demonstration here. Alrighty, guys, here we are in the office of our JF-17 Thunder in our beautiful Royal Daimar Air Force skin. That is going to be made public as soon as possible here for you guys. So as you guys can see, we've got that new LS6250 dual rack on both of our wings here. And yep, it's on our left wing as well. We've also got ourselves a nice SA6 sight out in front of us to engage with these new weapon types. And you guys will see that just like the ability of the Hornet and the uh, F-16 to engage targets with JSAOs at a standoff range, the JF-17 now has that as well. It had it before in the LS-6500, but you did not have that magazine depth as we talked about earlier. And that's kind of a problem when you're going after a SAM site where it's, you know, a conglomerate of different units that need to be taken out. A search radar, a track radar, as well as, of course, you know, the launchers themselves. Of course, if you get the search radar and the track radar, you're pretty much good to rock and roll. But why not go ahead and try and take out some of those launchers as well, so that way the bad guys can't just roll up with a uh, new radar, connect all the cables together, and Bob's your uncle, they've got a new SAM site. So let's go ahead and turn these mirrors off for some extra FPS. We'll come down here, we'll get some lights on. I absolutely love the color of the floodlights in the JF-17. We'll go to our air-to-ground mode. And we've got our LS6250s, which you can see the code for that in the aircraft is 625, which makes sense. That might be a little bit confusing for folks, but it is our LS6250. Our mode is going to be target of opportunity mode. We're going to be using our WMD-7 targeting pod as our method of designating targets today. Our weapon is the 625, so that's absolutely adequate there. Our fusing, we're just going to go ahead and go for an impact fusing as opposed to a delayed fusing. We're not engaging armored targets here. As you guys know, radars are about the softest targets around, that's for sure. So we've got that page basically set up and good to go so i'm totally fine with going away from that page we'll go over go to our pod wmd7 we'll turn it on we'll uncage her and then we will slave her to our waypoint and the jf-17 is honestly the most modern aircraft in dcs world the avionics in it just absolutely work the human interface for it is the best in uh, DCS world, in my opinion. It's just that the jet just does not have the name recognition of the kind of F series and teen series of jets that we are all used to. 
as well, of course, it's probably not as effective as, you know, an F-16 or an F-A-18, but for nations that cannot afford to acquire F-A-18s and F-16s, the JF-17 is a very, very nice alternative. That especially goes for nations that just are not allowed to buy those F-A-18s and F-16s. So that would be a good example of that is like the nation of Argentina. Now the British are never going to allow Argentina to buy F-A-18s from the U.S. or F-16s from the U.S. But the Chinese for a long time now have attempted to sell the JF-17 to Argentina because they can do so without uh, really worrying about what the British are going to do. So we can see on our HSD over here, we've got our weapon range indicator on the HSD. The weapon definitely has the range to engage our SA-6 site from exactly where we are right now. However, we're limited due to the fact that our targeting pod here isn't really the best targeting pod in the game. I would say that the Lightning, especially the Lightning version 3 that we have available to us in the Aviate B Harrier is a much, much more capable pod. We have to get within about 20 nautical miles for our WMB7 to allow for an area track on the ground. Otherwise it just goes into rates, very similar to how that works in the Lantern pod of the F-14 and we have a very hard time actually designating a target. But if you use the LS6 series of glide bombs and then the JDAM series, of course, uh, then you can get a little bit more standoff range from it. So as an example of that, so if we try to designate, see how it just goes into rates mode and it, I have to like actively slew the pod to maintain position. So let's go ahead and re-go Let's re-slave it back to a waypoint. The air-to-ground radar display in the JF-17 is also very, very nice. I really, really like that. And we'll wait till we're close to 20 nautical miles. Alright, right. the SA-6 down there is tracking us. Still doesn't want to go into area track. There we go, area track. There's the track radar, let's engage that, of course. Paveway, search radar, paveway, launcher, paveway, no, second launcher, paveway. And there's a SAM launch. So we'll go ahead and go defensive to evade that SAM down there. And you can see this whole evolution here is very, very similar to how you would engage a SAM site with a JSAL in the F-16 or F-A-18. Now, because the Lightning Pod is just a better pod in the JF, or sorry, the F-16 and the F-A-18, it's a lot, lot easier to acquire the target and get the full maximum standoff potential out of your JSAUs. We look at the F-10 map here, we can see that we've definitely trashed those two missiles. That was a big maneuver that we just conducted, and they are out of energy. So we'll climb back up here, and we will observe the impacts of our LS-6 250s. Don't worry, Betty, they're not going to hit me. Now we can see our little LS6s are just motoring on out here. Well, rather than motoring, they're gliding on out. Hopefully they don't hit each other. They're kind of flying in formation here.
Let's get to a point where we're not going to have our pod masked so we can get a nice good view. Boom. 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 Nice. I believe that that SAM site is going to be absolutely shacked. Well, maybe it looks like the tracking radar may have survived. Now let's check the F-10 map. On the F-10 map, we've got ourselves... Yep, looks like the tracking radar survived. This launcher down here is definitely dead. This SA-6 launcher here is pretty much gone. And it looks like the uh, search radar is absolutely gone. Yep, search radar is gone. That guy's gone. That guy's damaged. And it looks like the bombs fell just short. Yet, yeah, I've noticed that the WMD-7 pod is not nearly as good as the pods that we have available to us in the F-16 or F-A-18. And that is just a function of its Chinese technology, and it's made to be cheaper for export to those very poor countries that can't afford an aircraft like the F-16 or F-A-18. However, this jet has a lot of cool stuff going for it. But one thing that I will say is I really, really hope that DECA Ironworks decides one day to change up what's available to the aircraft in terms of its FOX-2 capabilities. There are plenty of photographs out there of JF-17 Thunders, specifically in the Pakistani Air Force, carrying AIM-9 Sidewinders and even AIM-9 mics. The JF-17 is built from the ground up in order to allow the aircraft to interface with Western weapons, so that way a nation like, say, Argentina, for instance, that already has a large stockpile of Western weapons, like the AIM-9 Sidewinder, could very, very easily just mate those weapons onto their aircraft with very little trouble. In fact, the JF-17, with just a little bit of software tweaking, can even interface with the AIM-120 AMRAAM. So please, 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 DECA Ironworks, please allow your module to utilize the AIM-9 Sidewinder. Now, I'm not saying the AIM-9X because that's a completely different digital architecture, but I believe that the JF-17 should be able to, at least in DCS, utilize the AIM-9 PAPA, PAPA-5, Lima, and Mike, and that would significantly increase the capabilities of the JF-17, and I think a lot more people would fly it as a result. So thanks for watching the video, guys. I hope you enjoyed it, and uh, we'll see you in the next one. Please give a like and a subscribe.